Australia, a top investment destination. Take a look. Australia's resilient economy withstood the challenges of 2020. Now, our $2 trillion economy is forecast to grow faster than the other G7 group of countries. With successful export industries, innovative international talent, global connections, and a stable business-friendly economy, Australia is a great investment destination. Discover more at austrade.gov.au forward slash benchmark dash report. Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to this US-Australia dialogue on cyber security. I can't think of a time when cyber security has been more at front and centre of discussions at political level, at the business level and across the community as we become more aware of cyber threats. But cyber is both a threat and an opportunity and today this dialogue is all about what we are doing in this space to be more secure but also the opportunities that that provides going forward. We've got a great panel coming up and a great moderator but before we get to that let me say that Australia takes the threat from cyber space very, very seriously. Over the last four or five years, Australia's cyber security strategies have evolved and we've just put out a new international strategy around cyber and critical technologies. Because what we're finding today is that there are all these technologies which can have civilian uses or they can have military uses. They can be used in good ways or they can be used in bad ways. And the challenge for democracies like ours with our sort of values is how do we harness the power of data and information in a way which is consistent with our values. We're working very closely with our American partners in this exercise. Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has welcomed our recent cybersecurity strategy, our latest update. He recognises how important that is to the ongoing campaign and cooperation that we're seeking to grow with both the United States and like-minded partners in this space. The Quad Working Group on Critical and Emerging Technology is looking at standards in these sorts of areas, critical and emerging technologies and cyberspace. Very important, who sets the standards in these areas will have a big say on what the future looks like. So for us, this is a major challenge going forward. And today is a great opportunity, as I said, to talk about threats and opportunities. The panel we've assembled is a fantastic panel. We've got Maureen Allison from Johnson Johnson, Chief Information Security Officer. Sam Crowther, who's uh, put together a startup which is going great guns, Casada, which looks at automated threats and dealing with them. Megan Dubofsky from 1011 Ventures, who specialises in funding in this space and my good friend Malcolm Turnbull, a great Australian, someone who's always embraced the future with confidence and optimism and who understands and has been intimately involved in the evolution of Australia's cyber security strategies over the last few years. And our moderator is Tobias Feakin, Australia's ambassador for cyber security and critical and emerging technologies. He's responsible for taking Australia's message to the world for developing partnerships with other countries as we seek to promote our credentials and our values in the cyber and critical technology spaces. Thank you, Tobias, for your work in bringing to the day together and for moderating the session. Tobias comes to us from ASPE and from work in London on these issues, so he has a great background in this space. So, Tobias, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy today. It's going to be really fascinating. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Sinodinas. Um, and what a champion Ambassador Sinodinas has been of the digital environment um, and all things cyber um, in all of his time in government. Um, what, what a pleasure to be here again today as well at uh, this G'day USA event. It's um, become a, an absolute steadfast part of my calendar over the past three to four years in, in this position. And what a privilege it is to be part of such an amazing panel. Um, I, I would love to be one of those lucky individuals who are watching at home in your offices, wherever you may be in this new digitized flexible world that we're all now living in. 
um, the fact that we have over 500 people on the line today, I think is testament to the interest that's been generated by such an awesome panel. So um, as Ambassador Sinadina said, um, we have an amazing panel for you today. We have Maureen Allison, Sizo from uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Sam Crowdia, CEO of Casada, a cybersecurity startup, uh, Megan Dubofsky um, from 1011 Ventures, uh, so we've got the, the, the money in the room, um, and of course, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, previous Prime Minister of Australia. So I was thinking, you know, we have an ex-Prime Minister, a venture capitalist, a CISO, and a cybersecurity uh, company startup lead. Um, there's got to be a joke in and amongst there somewhere. Um, not that I've got that on the tip of my tongue right now, but I think it's a perfect mix to have um, a really focused discussion on a whole range of issues. Um, and I'm really delighted that, that we have this panel with us today. So we have um, just under an hour um, to have this discussion. And I think let's get down to business. Let's get everyone into the room um, and talking about a few key issues. And um, if I may, I'm going to uh, point to Malcolm Turnbull first, um, just to give us a bit of a scene setter. Um, and Malcolm, in many ways, um, I guess I have you to thank for the fact that this position exists and, and the foresight um, that you had to uh, bring a senior international lead into the government mix. Um, but I'm really interested in your take um, on, you know, what was the secret source of the 2016 cybersecurity strategy? Because certainly from an Australian perspective, it was a game changer in the way that we as a nation looked both at the um, the technical issues around cybersecurity, but also that broader interest piece around um, how we make the most of this um, opportunity that uh, the cyber domain offers us and still does continue um, uh, to do so today. And um, also how we develop the skills, talent, and a whole array of other um, aspects of it. So you know, we're operating in a completely different environment today. And much of that is down to the the process and, and the policies that you put into play. So Malcolm, I wondered if you could kick us off um, and, and just talk <laughs> us through that approach that you took um, in 2015-16 in, in setting that up. Yeah, well, well, thanks, Toby. And, and uh, thank you, Arthur, and congratulations to all everyone who's on this call, um, including Sam. Uh, I'm privileged to be a shareholder and director of his company. And as, of course, Megan's a 1011 Capital are also investors in Casada. Look, um, the the 2016 uh, cybersecurity strategy recognized was really connected to the national innovation and science agenda. Uh, I wanted to put science, uh, innovation, technology right at the centre of Australia's uh, economic uh, priorities. Um, cybersecurity uh, is is of increasing. Um, uh, significance, increasing um, importance, particularly as you know, more and more of our computing, our data, our transactions, our, our industry moves to the cloud, uh, particularly as you move to more virtualization, to more containerization. You know, these are all trends that uh, offer enormous opportunities, but increase the uh, vulnerabilities, increase the risk factors. Um, and so uh, what that, that, you know, that, that represents great challenges. I mean, you can't be scared about it and hide under the doona, uh, but it creates great challenges, but also great opportunities. Now, I have always been inspired by the brilliance of the people at the Australian Signals Directorate. I've had a bit to do with uh, intelligence and signals intelligence during my career including, of course, defending the old spy Peter Wright in the 1980s against the British government. He taught me a lot about signals intelligence circa the 1950s and 1960s. But the, the, the bottom line is that um, there's some very brilliant people there. There are a lot of very brilliant people like Sam who've come out of ASD um, and um, indeed James Campbell, who's uh, one of the founders of Cato, that Megan's firm, and, uh, and, and mine have uh, invested in recently. It's been in the news, Cato Securities. So really the, the question is, are we going to be aware of this issue? Are we going to be prepared for it? And are we going to seize the opportunities it presents? So in other words, the cybersecurity strategy was a wake up call. 
It was about awareness. It was about preparedness, but it was also about encouraging Australian uh, brains, Australian intellect and ingenuity to get on board and take advantage of these opportunities. And so we, you know, hopefully this has encouraged a number of uh, Australian cybersecurity companies. And really, I think it's, uh, well, I know it has. And, you know, that's that was that was always part of the agenda. I mean, I just finished with this little observation. One of the things that people uh, in government often fail to appreciate is the spillover benefits from government activities, whether it is in, in any area. And that, that's partly because treasury economists struggle to actually quantify it. And I can understand that because you do start to get into speculation, build on speculation. But just because you can't always reliably measure it doesn't mean it isn't real. Uh, you know, that's why the Israelis say the founder of the Israeli tech sector was Charles de Gaulle, because he banned arms exports to Israel back, you know, way back when in the 1960s, I think, or 50s. And the and so just as we've seen with our whole defense industry plan with the, uh, with the cybersecurity strategy, that you put more direction and investment into government initiatives, and that has a spillover benefit. Because not only does the private sector engage, but smart people work for government for a while and they go off and work somewhere else. I mean, a good example in the US, another company we're invested in, it's not, not an Australian one, but it operates here, uh, is Dragos, started by Robert M. Lee, you know, great, one of the great talents out of the NSA. So that's, that's what it's all about. It's, it's about national security. It's about economic growth. It's about innovation and tech and you know they're all bound up together and I'm just thrilled to be here and thank you for the the uh for the uh, opportunity to speak as usual at excessive length uh thanks thanks so much Malcolm um not at all I mean it, you know you really set that tone I think um which was showing leadership um and being willing to take on these issues which often I think um in the past anyway um leaders have found um perhaps uh, a bit intimidating to take on because it's been always been perceived as a very technical issue. And you certainly just decided to take that on, obviously with your background and, and your interests in these areas too, which helped. But I can certainly say in the time that I've been in government, there's a wholesale shift in the way that cybersecurity is looked at, identified and prioritized. Um, and also now the increased interest in all things technology uh, within government as well. So there has been, you know, a wholesale shift um, in, in the way that the government looks at technology issues. And for, you know, pol policy wonk like me, who's looked at tech issues for, which is scary to say, I still feel young, but 25 years now, um, it, it's, it's a wholesale different environment that we're operating in, in the way that technology and cybersecurity are prioritized um, across the board. And I wonder, um, perhaps if we can shift to Sam now, um, because you, you've already been mentioned by uh, uh, Malcolm in his comments. Um, and I just wondered if you could reflect on, on anything in particular that you think's changed in um, the policy settings or, or just the cybersecurity environment that's really assisted you in, in giving you that foot up and any reflections you might offer on that interesting switch that you made from being inside you know, the Australian Signals Directorate and then spinning out into, um, into industry. We're really interested in your view on what are some of the changes you've seen and how has that benefited um, the, the growth that you're going through right now? Thanks, Toby. Yeah, so we actually benefited a lot from the work that Malcolm did, particularly the formation of Ost Cyber. So I think one of the, the really important things that happened early on for us, you know, with any startup, right, you've got to get validation with customers. And, you know, OS Cyber provided a pretty awesome almost new launch pack for us to, you know, have a customer that was government, which was really legitimizing, but then also a bit of a platform to get out into the industry. And, and you know, without that, maybe we could have done it, but it would have taken far longer. And I think that's a really important thing that governments can and should be doing is, you know, su supporting homegrown technologies, both from a, you know, actually using them to help make them better. Uh, and then also helping get getting them into the big industries of, of that economy. 
right? Because there's there's a lot to be said for you know big government customers when it comes to legitimizing a business and also legitimizing a problem that's trying to be solved. Um, and you know, I look back at particularly our early customer base and and how much the impact you know of even working with Lost Cyber actually had, and it was you know it was enormous. So that was that was really awesome to see, and and you know great that that we're doing that in, in Australia. Um, for me personally, uh, my time at ASD was relatively short. I was a little bit of an annoying teenager and convinced them to uh, to let me do some work with them. But that was really, for me, what was like the catalyst, right? For like, This is the industry I want to be in. I just got exposed to so many brilliant problems surrounded by, you know, people who are truly, truly incredible. And, you know, that sort of really took me down the rub hole. As soon as, you know, I finished high school, I had the opportunity to work with Macquarie Bank and was just so hell bent on doing everything I could in this industry. And then a lot of the problems I was actually exposed to at ASD uh, kept bubbling up at Macquarie and was sort of like, all right, let's 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 see if we can solve this problem for real and, and you know, build a business that's going to help a lot of people around the world. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's... It's interesting as someone who's come from outside of government in, I think these kinds of, you know, I, I, it's become a more distinct feature, I think, of government um, and industry is that, you know, you can be more cyclical in these kinds of career paths and, you know, skills that are applicable inside government equally applicable outside. And it's great to see that, you know, your company's going great guns um, and succeeding. I think maybe a question we could come back to later on. Um, and sorry, I should also champion the fact that Oz Cyber do an awesome job. Thank you for giving them a shout out. We're all big fans. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate to be part of many of the uh, international delegations that they've helped put together um, ar around the world. So and it, it's fantastic to see um, the successes that are emanating uh, with, with their assistance. Um, I, I'm still interested in the idea that um, are, are we or do we necessarily need to retain um, some of our, our cybersecurity firms? Are we, are we still enabling them enough in the domestic context so that they can succeed at home? And, and you know, I think that's a, still a live discussion about, you know, what, what else could be done um, um, from an Australian perspective to make sure that our cybersecurity firms are, are growing at home as much as they are um, internationally and succeeding as you are. Um, Megan, I wonder if I could bring you in here and I'd be interested in your view of, um, do you see anything special about the Australian scene right now? And you don't obviously have to answer yes, just because I'm trying to load you with a, <laughs> a particular answer. Um, but, you know, is there anything interesting that you see as a venture capitalist around the Aussie scene? Um, but equally, where do you see the most exciting investment opportunities currently writ large in, in the cybersecurity world right now? Thanks very much, Megan. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much for having us here. Um, you know, 1011 invests just in cybersecurity companies. Um, so that to us, it, it's about finding the best cyber talent in the world. And um, we really uh, have always been globally focused um, because we think, you know, cyber is so specialized that it's really about finding the most compelling talent to address the most painful problems in security. And specifically, we're focused on um, really that technological innovation to solving those tough problems. And yeah, I mean, I'm happy to say that we really feel like we found um, those deeply technical founders in Sam, of course, and then also in James Campbell at Cato Security, who is also ASD and an Australian national with his co-founder, Chris Dillman. Um, and I think that those founders are technically brilliant for sure, but also um, really able to extend in other areas of, of building a company. So we've been impressed with the extension of um, how those uh, founders have really reached into go to market, into um, people operations, really building a strong culture for those companies and, and really having a lot of ambition to play on a global stage. So for us, yes, definitely, um, we see a lot of talent there. As a firm, I think we would just agree with Mr. Turnbull's um, position that there is so much technology in the world that is enabling us to do great things. And part of that is finding the security solutions to enable that technology. And so be that um, 
working in the cloud or using data uh, in a responsible and safe way, um, or even new technologies um, sort of on the cusp, we're definitely interested in making sure the right security solutions are there. And so we see a, a lot of opportunity. Thanks, thanks so much um, for that, Megan. Um, I'm interested now to bring uh, Maureen into the conversation as well. Um, and there's there's so much to discuss. Um, being a CISO um, at Johnson Johnson, I'm sure you never have um, a boring day in in, in your job. I haven't ever. had one yet in ten years. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Awesome, and good to see you again. I we last good saw each other in California. Too. Yeah, when we could all travel a little while ago. Um, I remember really impressive conversations that we had um, then. I'm I'm interested in your view um, <clears throat> on you know what. And, and I know often we, you know, often these conversations are so threat based and you, you can sometimes go into too much about the threat, but I'm interested in your view as to what, what, what's happened in the threat environment. Has it changed significantly? Um, is it that the techniques, technologies are different um, or is it um, are the patterns of attack changing? Just interested in your view of um, that threat environment uh, and, and how you see it. Thank you. Uh so first of all, thank you to the American Australian Association for having me here. I certainly appreciate it to, to be your American representative here uh, as a CISO. Uh, also 18 months ago, 20 months ago in September of 2019, I was in Sydney for a medical device security conference uh, where we were talking about some of the very same it, uh, issues. And it's funny, it's like what the threat was in September 2019 to what we are seeing today. And if COVID has done anything for the world, it has made, uh, I, I feel like almost everyone is a hacker and trying to come after some somebody's data somewhere. And we talk about a lot about tech, but it really is, it ends up what technology do we have to protect data? because that's what people are going after. The commodity of our countries, of our companies today is around people data. Now, of course, with privacy laws around the world, it puts a different lens on how you can protect that. Now, you know, 18 months ago, literally, um, you know, J&J was an important target for some of the adversaries. Uh, but um, as we moved into production of a vaccine, it changed my risk profile. What didn't change was the technologies that I had in place to protect against those. And um, as you look at in, a, in an organization, I'm always looking at brand new technologies to go against the threat. The threats are literally, there are four of them. There are nation states, um, there are criminal th threats, there's hacktivists, and there's insider threat. And you can break them up any other way. People will do things with them. But the reality is, is that it's the who is coming after a company or a country uh, and what, um, what capabilities do they have? So in that instance, the threat is always changing, but the, the uh, threat actors don't tend to change in the buckets. Um, it's what is what are we expecting of corporations? How big are my walls? How deep is my moat? And am I gonna continue to try to do that? Or do I have to look at another way? And this is where the venture capital companies are like my friends because they're very nimble and can look at different ideas. So from a CISO perspective, um, I can't build a bigger wall. I can't build a, a bigger moat. So now I'm looking in, how do I move to zero trust? How do I know what my assets are? How do I protect the data at its core? And especially, I mean, come on, you know, uh, Malcolm was talking about in the 50s and 60s, and I'm thinking our mainframes and how easy it was to protect data during those days. We had rack app and green screens. Nobody, nobody outside the building could actually go in to actually look at the data. Today, um, as we've moved into a digitalized world, and we all have to move there, we found this year, 
those leaning into digital, digital and had the items in the cloud, their data in the cloud, were able to recover from COVID very um, much quicker than those that were still with a client server inside of their corporations. As we move to 5G, quantum computing, these will change how the threat and how we defend. And this is where I lean on uh, Megan and Sam to come up with uh, innovative ideas to help me solve these problems because I as a CISO at J&J &J, will not be able to solve them all by ourselves. Absolutely, look, I, there's so much to um, take out of what you just said there. Um, I mean, interestingly, if I just reflect from a government perspective on the threat environment that we, we, we currently find ourselves in, what we found during this, the period of COVID, um, hitting us was, you know, the obvious statement that, you know, the increased digitization of society um, and government writ large businesses all going online. So that threat platform, or if you like, the threat surface is, is vastly expanded. Um, I guess our reflection at a top level was that it, it was more we saw a repurposing of tools and redirection of threat patterns that we'd seen towards the health sector, towards those individuals at home. Um, and certainly something we were, as a, as a country, not happy with at all was the way that we saw um, states and non-state actors go after the healthcare sector. Um, and certainly when we think about some of the agreements that we've made in the, uh, you know, in the UN, where we've said that critical national infrastructure is out of bounds during peacetime, you know, what more critical piece of critical infrastructure could you have than your healthcare sector during a pandemic? Um, so we certainly made movements at the UN there, but also, you know, most importantly, as you've rightly pointed out, how, how do we work better together um, to, to, to operationalize, you know, good cybersecurity? And again, I think that's still one of the pieces of secret source that we, we still haven't quite got there. Um, and I'm not sure what perfect looks like, but I'm, I'm interested in taking panelists reflections on, you know, we often talk about public private partnership um, and um, it, it, we, what do the panelists think best practice looks like in that regard? How do we work more effectively together? Um, and I'll give you, you know, my perspective from this job's perspective, it's about being open to constant conversations with um, big tech firms, big cybersecurity delivery firms, all the way down to tiny little SMEs and trying to understand what their issues are, um, trying to share as far as you can, whether it be through threat information, policy cycles, and keeping that conversation going as long, as hard as possible. Um, and then you get, you know, better trust and a better exchange of information. But I'm really interested, um, Malcolm, again, maybe if we can come back to you, because at the heart of a lot of the work that you were pushing was this idea of closer cooperation with the private sector. How, how do we do that better? Um, and, and the, you know, Governments do certain things really very well, um, but but it's it's sometimes pushing us, I guess, in terms of the risk appetite that we might have. But I wonder, Malcolm, and, and any panelists who'd like to jump in, perhaps, um, just to talk about what that public-private, you know, piece could look like. How can we do that better? Look, I think the uh, the, the critical thing is actually at a human level. Um, Governments have a tendency to prefer to deal with big systems integrators. Uh, and uh, it is always a struggle to get government departments to deal with smaller companies. And indeed, often it's hard to get big companies, uh, Marines, obviously a great exception to this, uh, to deal with smaller companies. You know, you need to be, you just have to have a very, very open-minded approach. Um, you know, that, that's, I, I'm not trying to single out IBM here, but you know, that old saying, no one got fired for, for buying IBM. Well, um, you know, uh, we had a, a, as you know, the 2016 census crashed, uh, and it was IBM's fault, and they ended up apologizing for it. And they, it was a, you know, there was a long, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, uh, Alistair McGibbon did the review of it, as you know, Toby, and I mean, that was just a good example, you know, so big companies can screw up on cybersecurity. And so you cannot outsource your responsibilities as a sizer. That's number one. You can't just sort of say, oh, well, I've signed off to a big company, so I don't have to worry about it myself. You are responsible. 
And if you're the CEO, you are ultimately responsible. But I think the important thing is to be just very open-minded and recognize that there is an ecosystem out there which is very innovative and very often, even in relatively new companies, tech companies, a culture of not invented here develops. A sort of hierarchical, you know, top-down uh, culture develops. And so it's just, I mean, I look, I mean, as you know, Julie Bishop's old, you know, great gag always was uh, the reason, you know, I'm so um, interested, I've always been so keen on innovation is because I get bored quickly, uh, which has a, um, which has an element of truth in it. But, you know, that's the, that, that is, that's the critical thing. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. There was a company that we started in the early 90s called FTR. Uh, future uh, for the record, and it was a quite a, a very very innovative uh, uh, business that had proprietary hardware and software for digitally recording and managing hearing room and courtroom proceedings. I mean, this is you know like this is when Dragon Dictate voice recognition software was you know didn't work or didn't work effectively. You know, it's a different era. Anyway, uh, the the product was installed in literally thousands and thousands of courtrooms and hearing rooms all around the world, particularly in America. And I remember this is long before I got into politics. The Australian Parliament uh, wanted to buy this tech. They could have bought a shrink-wrapped Australian product, but they went off and bought a very expensive bespoke product from France, which, by the way, didn't work. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, there is a sort of a, and sometimes um, you find that, uh, you know, I used to say in Canberra that you know, sometimes the least patriotic parts of the federal government were in the, uh, for the people involved with procurement. Um, the, you know, I, you, you just, you, you just have to be constantly looking for, pro, proactively for people with new ideas and be prepared to test bed them. I mean, what does it cost you to trial something out? I mean, you might, I mean, if you're entrepreneurial about it, you might even be able to say to a young company, look, here's, um, you know, here's a few, uh, 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 here's a few dollars, we'll take a share and we'll also um, test bet it. And, you know, who knows? I mean, it's a, the Israeli big companies, is, Israel have been doing that for years, including government agencies. Just, just before any other panelists might pop in here, I, I, I think I couldn't agree with you more strongly. Um, something that we did, uh, we do a lot of cyber capacity building around the region um, to try and assist other nations who are, you know, perhaps not quite as far along their cybersecurity journey um, as Australia is fortunate enough to be. Um, and one thing that we trialed in the Solomon Islands was um, using some of our development assistance money as seed money to tiny startups. And we ran programs with four different startups to try and find digital ways of linking up the education sector to uh, the jobs market, both in the Solomon Islands and internationally. Um, and, you know, with the understanding that that money, it, it, you know, it's, it's to try and push companies out there and help them develop their IP and, and their technologies, but understanding that not all those projects would succeed and, and being accepting of that. Um, and really pleased with the end results that we got, actually. And, you know, we got uh, two of those companies succeeded tremendously in that environment. And that, to me, I, I'm thankfully Megan's nodding, <laughs> you know, because that's a pretty good success rate in terms of your investment in that kind of startup environment. Um, but I appreciate that, you know, that's quite a risky approach um, to take, but it's the end results should outweigh that risk. Um, and another risk that we took during... Um, Malcolm's time um, in, in government was building an entire cybersecurity operations center for the PNG government um, ahead of the APEC leaders meeting. And that was, um, you know, it was low time scales, high risk, but I'm just so pleased now to say that that is owned and run by the PNG government um, delivering cybersecurity solutions for them. Um, and I think, you know, that sense of adventure is important in a, such a fast moving environment. Um, and, and, you know, Sam, perhaps what are, what are your reflections in terms of, 
you know, what, what Malcolm just said there, are you finding that shifting at all? Um, I'm certainly starting to see evidence of more Aussie startups inside uh, government, you know, uh, networks, but Sam would be really interested in your view. Well, at least in Australia, I think over the last five years, things have changed quite a lot, but I really like the example you gave Toby. I think, you know, thousand dollars, you know, every thousand dollars you pay a startup probably goes 10 times further than every thousand dollars you know, you pay a much larger organization. And if you can, you know, run experiments and you know, fail fast or succeed, I think it's, going to put any government or any organization in a pretty awesome spot. I don't think it's one of the problems we usually have on the defense side is the folk on the other side of the keyboard can pivot with a moment's notice. And if it takes us months and months to, to do anything, you know, we're going to be scrambling to, to keep up. So I think if governments and the like could adopt mind, mindsets like that, we're going to let's run experiments. Let's see what actually works and then go down that path when it does. I think that would uh, that would have a lot of benefit, both in the general security of you know, government groups that are leveraging that approach, but then also the organizations that would support and, and bring up who would help ultimately secure you know, companies around the world from that next wave of threats that government sometimes faces first. Perhaps Megan and Maureen, I could ask you, is there, is there anything do you think different in the US setting? Do you think there's a bigger risk appetite um, for uh, SMEs and the kinds of technology offerings they have. Really interested in in both your views. Um, I think sometimes Marie. our data is a bigger target, which um, takes us out of the idea that you know I can only look at a vendor or it has to be a large vendor. I think the venture capital market in the United States has grown so large, and and there is a good portion of um, uh, foreign uh, companies that. I, not foreign is a bad word, companies from different countries that are in the United States that are working in venture capital because our market, us being a target, is so large. So you will see a very large mix of uh, some Israeli companies or Irish companies or, or Australian companies that will come to the United States because they know if they've got something they know if they can launch it with the venture capital that's in the US, it gives them a better start and, and a bigger opportunity to sell. But as a CISO, um, I, I care not. Um, I'm less concerned uh, with where the, the originators of the, the um, software or the, the technology are from. And I'm more worried about what capabilities and um, I think that uh, the US companies, because we've seen this, that even some of the CISO organizations have innovation that they're looking at, and we will be testing technologies wherever they're at, if they can solve the problem. Um, you know, I think back to when APTs uh, 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 about a decade ago, and APTs were all the rage, and um, it was like trying to find the invisible man in the room. And um, I cared less about who created the technology to show me where the impressions on the carpet were. I was looking more for a technical solution to the problem. And you see a lot of that. Um, and with uh, there's been a large rise in investment uh, firms, uh, venture capital in the US that you see. And in fact, hey, the, the very last travel I did before we went into lockdown was to RSA. I go to RSA or used to go, but this year I think I do it virtual, but the, I love RSA, not for the big booths out front that give me all the swag, but for the vendors on the back row, because there I will find innovative ideas in people who are leaning and looking into problems um, differently than maybe the large companies will. Yeah, I mean, Megan, you must deal with a lot of risk in in uh, you know the investment world, uh, and you know how, how do you assess that then? What do you look for um, in companies when you're about to press go on an investment in a, in a in an SME? I think that's probably really valuable and interesting for anyone who's on the line in SME and thinking, oh, we need more capital. How do we attract it? You know, what, what are some of the, the, the examples you could use of, of good practice in that and what you would invest in? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I would just add that in, 
we also see companies struggle with the decision to try to go after the US government as a market versus going after private sector. And sometimes that can be a difficult decision for companies because the buying process is completely different <laughs> in the public sector <laughs> and they have to make a decision on how to allocate resources. And so the go to market decision seems easier to focus on private enterprise. And we obviously, um, do as much as we can to help interface through consultants or you know through our government relationships in bc we have a entrepreneur in residence who's actually quite um experienced in selling to government but but still it can be a difficult decision for companies uh just when you know they think it's about having to hire an entirely new person just to run federal sales um it, it definitely can be a difficult decision i think when we are making a decision obviously we're looking uh for demand signals from uh, companies like J&J &J and others who are showing evidence that, that this is a problem that needs a more sophisticated technical solution. Um, 1011 has been around since 2015 as a specialized venture capital firm. So we really feel like we've been there uh, longer focused on cyber than maybe some investment firms who are not necessarily cyber focused um, or haven't been cyber focused for you know, as concretely and as for, uh, for long as we have. Um, but yeah, we're definitely in the beginning, first focused on what we call you know, the horse, what is the core technology? How is it solving the problem in a new and innovative way? How defensible is that technology? We're looking at the jockey. How is the CEO, the founder gonna be able to turn that technology into a sustainable, healthy, productive company? Can they get the talent around the table? We look at the go-to-market. Obviously, that is, um, is it private? Is it public? Can they do both? How translatable is that? Uh, and then, obviously, we look at the potential for the company in the long term and how we can we go in. And sometimes that's a risk calculation for us, uh, particularly lately, given <laughs> how much money is coming into the sector <laughs> and us trying to get in a good price. But yeah, we, we look at all of those factors, um, but you know, we pride ourselves on being able to assess that technology, but then also our relationships with the founders and um, their capacity to take the company to the next level. I've got like a whole host of really interesting things that I'd love to talk to you guys about. I realize, you know, we won't probably have enough time to get all of them on the table, but um, here's, here's the first one as a starter. Um, you know, often we band around the word trust in cybersecurity, in everything digital. Uh, Maureen, you mentioned, you know, we are increasingly a data-driven society, if not, um, you know, entirely. Malcolm, I remember, you know, there's no such thing, one of your lines, want no such thing as the digital economy, there is just the economy. Um, and most of that is, uh, you know, a, a digital anyway, so don't distinguish between the two. Um, do you think we are in a better place with trust with the public? on these issues and you know it's probably staying the obvious cybersecurity is clearly part of that trust model isn't it um where are we with trust from you know maureen whether it be from your customers to you know how do you feel you engender better trust in them sharing their data because incredible results that can be achieved in the medical world with increased sharing of, of medical data records and, and malcolm i remember we had that conversation um, in a pub in Wentworth about, um, you know, trust online and, and, you know, data, big data sets and what they can be used for to enable. Um, what we, I'm just really interested in panelists' views on that. Um, anyone who wants to kind of leap to the fore, please do. But I still think it's one of the fundamental questions in, in this area that we need to address. I think we're, our, um, most people just believe that they they can't trust anyone with their data and giving up their data uh, puts you at risk. Um, the, the, in the US, we have seen literally hundreds of privacy laws and implementations. And then what happens, it's not protecting the data any more than what was done before because it's around privacy and it's not, and it and is making people feel that, oh, I can, you know, I have a right to this. And they do have a right. It is their data. They need to feel comfortable. 
but I think there needs to be a lot more to be done. Um, as you had talked about, Toby, about the public and private relationship in sharing to be able to solve the problem. Right? It's, it's not that a large corporation is taking a box of data and putting it on the street for anybody to pick it up. There is a lot of money in corporations in government around the protection of that data. It is that threat that is coming at us and how big is it and what we can do about it. So a lot of to build the trust is going to be a change likely with the technologies that we use to protect data. It's also going to be around uh, companies being able to work with the government and the government to have uh, new views on what we do. Um, you know, in, in my line of work, we, we talk about, hey, if somebody came into my office and stole something out of my office, I would get a large response. Today, if somebody comes into a computer system and steals data, it's my problem because I didn't have good enough security. And so we need to kind of change that mindset to look at what we're dealing with. Um, security risk started out, you know, oh, you don't have good enough controls, uh, this is a problem. Uh, and then it has moved into where most good CISOs have made it talk about it as a business risk. How do we get funding? We talk about the risk to the business. We talk about not only, you know, non-compliance with privacy laws and laws around the world, but also around reputational risk. Um, and then what it can do to your business or the integrity of your data. But truly, if, if the colonial pipeline hack does anything, it's going to show that really the risk is a political risk to the way we live and breathe and, and our innovation for the future. And so it will require us to put on a new way of thinking on how to solve the problem. Thanks for that. Um, Ma Malcolm, I wonder if you could reflect on what you think has changed in that trust dynamic. Um, and it's going back a long time now, I think it was 2013 when we had that conversation on a, on a stage in Wentworth and we spoke yeah. about it. Yeah, it, 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 it was around the time of the Edward Snowden, um, uh, you know, breaches, uh, disclosures. And I remember what I was, um, I thought there would be more indignation about the revelation of the extent to which, um, you know, security agencies, NSA in particular, was effectively, uh, you know, spying on people and collaborating with, uh, 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 you know, um, you know, telcos and others to, you know, ac access information. Um, you know, something which, by the way, has been going on forever. But uh, the, um, and what I what what I think we both were surprised by because you were one of the people I invited to this was in the Imperial Hotel in Paddington for those of the Sydney coordinates it was a the audience was I guess there probably would have been about a hundred people there I was in my capacity as the local member always happy to combine my constituents with beer and um, good discussion and what it was a thirty the the audience I would say would have been overwhelmingly between twenty five and thirty five and they were completely unfazed to my astonishment. Uh, and there was one young woman who summed it up and she said, she said, I think she spoke for most of the people who, and she said, look, she said, I know that Google reads my emails and sends me really dumb ads. Um, but you know what? I don't care because I get a really good email service for free. And I, that blew me away. Um, and uh, I, so I think, you know, the Facebook generation, the digital natives do take it, you know, they, 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 I mean, look at what the stuff people put on Facebook, for heaven's sake, you know, <laughs> so, so the, you know, people, it's a different world, but I think that the, um, so I, I, I think, you know, my generation, I'm, I'm in my mid sixties, uh, is I think more sensitive to data than perhaps people in their 30s. I mean, you know, Sam, who, you know, is aspirational when it comes to being in your 30s, might be able to uh, give an insight into that. <laughs> but 
um, uh, something to look forward to. And uh, but I, 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 I do, you know, I, I, I think honestly uh, that they're just, you know, we have to be so much more um, aware of it. I mean, awareness is the key. I mean, one of my pet uh, questions, you may have been with me, Toby, when I used to do this, I used to say to CEOs, Maureen, um, you know, which I'd often meet as the Prime Minister and so forth, I'd say, do you know who your system's administrator is? Uh, who has administrative privileges in your network? And literally, most of them didn't know what I was talking, had no idea who, who or what I was talking about, you know? And, and the... Because you know the thing that the thing that people forget about Snowden, for example, is that Snowden was not a great, subtle, technical, brilliant hacker. You know, with who you know should have had three Nobel prizes for physics. He stuck an external hard drive into a server and just downloaded a lot of files. Now, you know, when I certainly. Uh, when I worked for Goldman Sachs, which was a long time ago, too, in the you know in the um, '90s, uh, I was a partner of Goldman Sachs. In fact, but the the if you put a thumb drive into a Goldman computer, I mean, you'd get fired. I mean, most of the most of the ports were um, you know were gummed up, so you couldn't do it. But I mean, literally, I mean, I always assumed that if you did that, you know, bells would ring and large people with guns would appear and frog march you out off the premises so you know there's a lot of very slack security i mean i mean again i don't want anyone to disclose any secrets but you know it's amazing how many industrial control systems include devices uh the user name for which is administrator and the password is uh four zeros i mean it's honestly it's the awareness is the big is, is the biggest part of the problem and the the you know, in a sense, that's what the big part of what the cybersecurity strategy was about to basically raise it up so that it was something that was discussed at board level and not just something that when the CISO started to talk about it, people lost interest. And this is where Maureen is so, you know, such an outstanding CISO, if I may say so, Maureen, because you are a great communicator. Because, you know, if you are a CISO who is incredibly technically accomplished, um, but cannot communicate to a more general audience, then you're actually probably not the right person for that role. You've got to, you've got to be able to be a, you've got to understand the technology and the technologists. Uh, so you've got to have the skills that you both have and that Sam has. But again, Sam's a good example. Another, you know, different different in a different context you know sam can explain what he does to people who have no idea what a line of code looks like they don't they think code is something you use you know to get into a safe you know it is it it, it that is a critical part of it so awareness is the key thanks malcolm um perhaps sam i could just get you to reflect you've been um identified as um being impressively young uh, so, so, I mean, do you, do you think there's a difference in the trust equation? I mean, in some ways, you know, we're so digitized now. And, and again, certainly COVID has pushed so much of our lives increasingly online. But in some ways, you know, the trust has been forced. Um, but do you, do you think there is a, 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 a kind of different sense of that trust equation now or, or an acceptance? What do you think? I, I think so. I mean, if I look at most of our new customers, you know, we've never met them and yet they trust us to protect something that is quite literally the, the key to their business at the moment right their their online platforms right? thanks to covid is is 100 percent of their business in in some cases so i think that's definitely changed quite a lot the us was always more forward leaning in that regard i think you know there is a lot more acceptance of you know I guess trusting people you may not have met if we look at it in, in that sense versus Australia who, you know, people love to meet in person, which I get to. Um, on, from a like more personal perspective, you know, I think, I, I personally don't really think twice about the, the data I have to give up most times to use um, many services. And I, you know, I think most of my friends are, are probably similar. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, as, as you know, my peers start to move into different leadership roles in, in organizations and have to make decisions. And that's something that you need, I have to be very, very conscious of 
uh, and I'm thankful that I have the knowledge of you know how bad things can be and why you shouldn't trust um, a lot of platforms, I guess, as well. Now, I'm, I'm in that tight situation, which is that um, there are a few minutes left uh, for us to discuss perhaps one more issue. Um, and uh, and, and it, it, there's so much more to discuss. Um, where, where am I going to go with this? Um, I think I really want to finish on what I think is one of the most important issues in certainly in terms of workforce and the changing landscape and the requirement, which is slapping on the table the gender and diversity issue in this environment um, and, and I apologize that it's come so late in the conversation but I'm um, I'm always shocked by the, the, the statistics about um, you know the lack of gender parity in in this environment and to be frank what a shocking economic loss that and and intellectual loss that is to our environment um, and I wondered first if I can go to Megan and, and Maureen and say well what can we do to begin to just change that equation? What, what can we do? Well, if you're a female founder, call me, <laughs> would be the first thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's good to highlight it and to know that to win this battle, we just need the best technology out there possible and that that comes from many different places. And I think that increasingly um, venture capital firms know that and are open to that. And um, I would, I really believe that about our industry. Um, and, and I think we're very open to hearing those ideas from everyone I know 1011 is, and, and we would love to be part of uh, the solution in that regard to get the best solutions out there, no matter who is behind them. Um, the thing that I would, say, that I would is say is that we need to hire women um, and it's not, you just hire women and they're not qualified. But as you had said, Malcolm, that uh, if the person is extremely technical and cannot communicate uh, the vision or what is needed in an organization and, and talk about the business and the political risk that's going to be impacting our companies, uh, that, um, we need to change the lens of who is in the CISO positions, but are in our cybersecurity organizations. What I find is, is that um, most people in information security from when I was young in the, in, in the, in the trade uh, were, were uh, security engineers or network engineers. And those are the individuals that became CISOs so what they did was they made organizations that reflect them, their level of experience, their level of knowledge and expertise. Uh, and so they wrote job descriptions that end up being exclusive and not inclusive of entire diverse populations in people from different ethnic origins, as well as men and women. There is software out there, um, and I believe there'll be someone who's who's in New Zealand, who's listening today, who's, uh, he told me that it was, it was very hard to hire women engineers. And he changed his job descriptions using a, te uh, a, uh, a technology that made it parity for male or female with the requirements, and then he hired women. And so it, that individual is extremely supportive of women and has been hugely uh, bringing in women into the organization. But we all have come with unconscious bias. And if anything um, that has taught us in the US, we need to look at those unconscious biases and recognize them. They're imprinted on us. There's nothing you can do but know you have them and not lean into them. And then what will happen is your organization will change. You'll start to hire people that are very qualified. Your people who look at risk, people who are investigators, they do not all have to be of a certain type. And sometimes you're much better if you look at the other diverse skills that are needed and then hire a workforce, which will then grow and give you the diversity you need to meet the challenge of cybersecurity uh, that we're facing today. Thank you so, so much, Maureen. Um, 
I've just got to acknowledge that Sam's about to hop off the call and, and the VTC. So thank you so much, Sam, for being with us today. Um, but I also Thanks want to say me. thank you. No problem. Real pleasure. Um, and we all look forward to speaking to you again soon and charting your meteoric success story. Um, I just want to say that, you know, gender and diversity issues are at the heart of the values uh, piece that we've put into the new international cyber and critical tech engagement strategy that Australia has just produced. The foreign minister uh, made a major speech two weeks ago uh, launching this document. Um, I'd encourage anyone, if, if you want to see what Australia stands for in the cyber and critical technology environment, um, please do have a look. Uh, international cyber and tech uh, Dot, uh, com dot au, sorry, dot gov dot au, um, and you'll, you'll find the strategy there. Um, I really, I've, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to have to thank all of our panelists. I, I found that incredibly stimulating discussion. Malcolm Turnbull, thank you so much for being with us today um, and sharing your knowledge and, and good luck with your, your cybersecurity ventures now and in the future. Uh, Megan Dubrovsky, thank you so much for all your words of wisdom. And you heard it here. If you're uh, a female startup lead, please get in touch immediately after this call. Um, sounds like you'll be on to a, a good thing. Um, Sam, who had to unfortunately leave us, um, fantastic seeing what he's doing in, in, uh, and, and going great guns in the cybersecurity space. And Maureen Allison, great to see you again. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom um, from Johnson Johnson's perspective. Um, I now need to hand over to Nick Nichols, the Australian Consul General in San Francisco for some closing remarks, but I just want to add my thanks to all the panelists and thank you for having me and allowing me the honor of chairing such a great group of people. Thank you. And thank you, Ambassador Toby Fleekin for moderating the panel. And thanks to Ambassador John Berry and his team at the Australian American Association for organizing today's uh, session. Um, Megan, I particularly liked your observation of Sam and other Australians for their ambition to play on the global stage. And we think that's a feature of Australian talent and businesses coming from an island nation as we do. And the four threats that Maureen mentioned obviously exist globally. And likewise, solutions to those threats um, can come from anywhere. And Sam and his company are proof of that. And Malcolm, who was is the architect, our former prime minister, the architect of Australia's our cyber security strategy um, mentioned the need to integrate small and new companies into important policy areas. And again, Sam and Casada um, are an example of that. In fact, Australia, Austrade works very closely with US investors like 1011 to develop Australian SMEs to bring their solutions to Australian policymakers and to corporations, as well as those in the US and other markets. So, if there are any investors on this call who would like more information about opportunities and opportunities in Australia, my team and I would love to hear from you. I guess my overall takeout from today is the shared responsibility of commercial actors and governments and governments in democracies like Australia and the US to ensure that the online world remains open, secure and free to commerce and the ideals that we share. Thanks again to the panel and good evening to those of you in the US and enjoy the rest of your day to those in Australia. Goodbye.